Today's scripture reading of God's Word, verse 2. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. All people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander, and every kind. Like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, chosen by God, and precious to him, you also, like living stone, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. priest? I want to start by reading a little bit from this Life and Light magazine. And we have so many things out there that we can do as songs. We can look at, at these different things uh, to worship and understand. There's Bible studies. There's Awanas. There's so many ways that we can spend time learning about God and serving, living out our lives for Him. This article is you are loved by Jesus and covered by His grace. Dream dreams, live for more. There is something inside of you, a dream. This is the kind of dream that God breathed into Moses as a child. Although it took a lifetime of Moses dying to self and recognizing that being made in God's image automatically qualified him as coachable and teachable. When Moses stopped saying, No, God... Saying, saying no, God was able to mold him into a man who would save a generation of people. How do you recognize your dream? Moses had his rod. What do you have in your hand that could help change the lives of others? Recognize that the very thing that God wants to use in your life begins with a gift, thought, or dream that you already have. You will not have to search far. Next, you have to accept the dream. You must answer the call. Most of us cannot imagine that God is using ordinary us for something so extraordinary. We lead, teach, care for others, do our Sunday thing, and go back home to the comfort zone. But God wants more. My church only has 39 spark parking spaces. Yet a small group of determined people dared to dream. We have now planted 20 churches across the United States. We must come alive and encourage life in those around us. We talked about that some in those dry bones of Ezekiel. Here's another article that you may want to look at. And just because I had some people asking about them, all you've got to do is go online if you don't have this magazine. And there are plenty back there. This is what the Free Methodist put out. And you can see all the different articles. And this says why we are free. I had a couple people asking me some more about that. So I printed off that article so you could see some more of what the Free Methodists believe. But today I want to talk about who we are individually collectively, and that we're priests. 
Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, may You bind it upon our hearts. May You pierce us by Your Spirit to carry out Your will rather than our own. May we die to ourselves and live for You through Jesus Christ. We just thank You and praise You for all that You do, especially that You would send Your Son to die to reconcile us back to You. Not only back to You, but in a relationship where You are our Father. We just thank You and praise You in the name of Jesus. Amen. So if you turn to Genesis, you look. It, all through Genesis, verse 1, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 4, verse 10, verse 12, verse 18, verse 21, verse 25. All say that it was good. Creation was good. God created a good thing. But it is in t- not until Genesis 1, that's what I'm going to be turning there. It says, God saw all that He made, and it was very good. We've got a word added in there, very. Why? Very good. And there was evening, and there was morning. It was the sixth day. That sixth day would have been on Friday in the, in the Jewish calendar. What else happened on Friday? Our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, wasn't it? That's why we call it Good Friday. Creation was over on Friday. The great finale had been, had been done. God created man and woman in His image. He created mankind in the image of God. To be like God. But we have a decision to make. We have a decision whether we're going to be obedient and come to Him or not. We are not a body with a soul. Do you understand that? We are a soul with a body. Your body is the vessel that you can use on this life for a limited number of days to serve God, your Creator, and God, your Redeemer and Lord, your Father in Heaven. It's a question you've got to answer. Mike asked it last week. He said, how are you living? In John 19, verse 30, we can see what happened on another Friday. It says, When He had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, He bowed His head and gave up His spirit. Because see, at that point, you were redeemed back if you believe in God's sacrifice through Jesus Christ, His Son. If you believe and put your trust and faith in God, He will redeem you through what Christ Jesus did on the cross. It would be finished. But you still have to make that decision. Are you going to live for Him or not? What are you doing with your life? God the Creator of all things. He is the one that, oh, oh, is our God, right? I belong to God. That created everything. What limited things we can see and the more knowledge that we can have and we can reach out further and further and see the vastness of space and everything else. Or when we do bigger and bigger microscopes, we can see the more complexity of life. That God created you to serve Him, to honor Him, to praise Him. And even when you rebelled from Him and said, I don't want any part of that, He said, I love you so much. I'm going to send my Son to die for you to get you back to a right relationship with me. That's our God. That's our Heavenly Father. The question for you today is, do you really believe Jesus? Do you believe His words? Do you believe what He came and taught, what He lived? Do you believe that His death has the power to conquer all? That it makes you a new creation in Christ? Do you believe that? And I mean believe with all your trust and faith again, not just believe with head knowledge, because even the demons know that. When Jesus cast out the demons, they said, Whoa, whoa, it's not our time yet. They knew who Jesus was and they tremble in fear at His name. But they don't believe in salvation through Him. They don't put their faith and trust in Jesus. So there's a big difference between simply believing and repenting of your thoughts and behavior, changing your heart where your life becomes anew, where you live a life. And Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. And when He said this, He was talking about those who did mighty works in His name. But He said, not all that come to Me, not all that cry, Lord, Lord, will be able to come to Me because I don't know them. I know those who have a relationship with Me who have put their trust in me, who are forever changed and live that life. So what did Jesus say? Let's look at a couple verses and see what He said. In Matthew 19, verse 17, it says, Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter 
life, if you want to have eternal life, keep the commandments. That's why God gave the law. He was there in the midst of Israel, and, and when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments, by the time he came down, they were sacrificing to idols already. And we look and say, how could they do such? But if we look at our own lives, don't we do the same thing? One minute we're praying to God, heal me of this and that, when He doesn't offer, uh, offer us the answer that we want in our prayers, we tend to lose faith. We say, don't you care, God? Are you not there, God? Can I not stand on your promises? But see, we can't keep those commandments. That's why Jesus came and died for us. But yet John says that if you sin, that, that confuses me because, wait a minute, am, am I not a sinner that's trapped in this power of sin? Well, I was, but now I'm redeemed. I'm a child of God. I belong to God. If I die to myself, Jesus can live through me. And my goal is to be like Christ, longing for that day when I spend eternity with God my Father, when I am not involved with any sin anymore. So He's given me the power to walk through this earth to be more and more and more like Christ, to grow up in my salvation, to live it out with fear and trembling. Another thing that Jesus said was in Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40. One of the scribes and Pharisees asked, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Not part of it, but all of it. With everything about you, this vessel of this body that you have. You do it with your speech. You do it with your thought. You do it with your body. You do it with your heart. You do it with your mind. You love God. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor, which is anyone you come in contact with, not those you choose, as yourself. And like I've said before, and I'll say it again, I love myself pretty good, so it sets a high standard up, doesn't it? So I've got to love them pretty good. Well, Christ gives us the standard much higher than mine. He says to lay down one life for their friend is the greatest love that we can have. And He teaches us to follow in His footsteps. Verse 40 says, All of the law and all the prophets, everything that you have heard and learned previously, every bit of it, hang on these two commandments. And see, there's no way that we could keep these commandments, just as the Israelites couldn't keep the commandments before, unless we die to ourselves and born again a new creation in Christ, with the power of the Spirit living through us. That's why Jesus said that He would not leave us as orphans. He would ask the Father and He would send the Spirit to do everything that you need Him to do in this life. But it's not about your life. It's about living your life from God. <clears throat> the speaker last week's video also said, How am I living? He made it even more personal. He just changed the statement around a little bit from how are you living to I've got to ask it myself. Instead of being asked to me, I've got to ask it. How am I living? Makes it a little more personal. Do I want to waste my life? Do I want to live a life of glory? And I've only got a limited amount of time and God Almighty sent His only Son to die for me. Why would I want to waste that life? Why wouldn't I want to be rich for God? Because I don't know when my life is going to be required. I've only got X amount of time to tell people of the love of God that He was given for me through Christ Jesus who shed His blood for me. So that's why I have to live with all my body, with all my heart, with all my soul, and to love my neighbor as myself so that they can see that. Because they're not going to see my preaching if they don't ever see the way I'm living. So I have a follow-up question to Mike's question on how are you living. Do you believe Jesus 100% put your trust and faith in Him? Because see, that's the first question. That's the difference in heaven or hell. That you don't have head knowledge, you have heart knowledge. What a terrible thing if you spent all your time in church or you spent all your time doing good things and everything else, but you didn't have that right relationship with God. And don't say it can't happen because I just quoted you from Matthew where it says that. He says, depart from me, I do not know you. But we did mighty things in your name, Lord. We even cast out demons. So I have to plead with you, beg with you, please know the love of God through Christ Jesus. 
If you don't know that, make it right today. All you've got to do is come to Him and say, Father, forgive me. I want to know You. And He'll come to you. He doesn't want to be unknown. John wrote his gospel so that you might believe, that you might have that trust and faith in God, so that it might forever change you. He's proof positive. He wanted to rain down fire from heaven to kill out the Samaritans because they didn't want to accept Jesus. And then you read 1st and 2nd and 3rd John and he says, Love, love, love. They'll know you by your love. Love your neighbor. Love, love, love. Because God loved you. That's all he talks about. Jesus said before he left, he said, take care of my mother because he knew that John had developed that kind of love, that he would take care of a woman that wasn't his own just like it was his own mother. And at the end of John, it tells you, it says John 20, verse 30 and 31, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe. Believe what? That Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. And that by believing, by having that faith and trust in Him, you may have life in His name. Now that's not just eternal life, but that's the abundant life that you were designed and created for in the first place. To be in a right relationship with God while your soul has this body on earth. We can make it through anything, even in this fallen creation, because we belong to God. And nothing can separate us from the love of God who is through Christ Jesus our Lord. So I'll look at three things in these verses that you may believe. That comes from the Greek word pisteo. It means to put total trust, that saving knowledge and faith. When we read in Hebrews, we read about the Old Testament saints that believed that by their faith it was counted righteousness unto them. A little stronger word. That word believe means total trust and faith. Don't just wipe it away and say, I believe it's going to rain today. But you have total 100% satisfaction it's going to rain today. You know what that takes? It takes seeing the rain, right? usually, right, for us to have that kind of faith. Well, we saw that kind of faith. Jesus Christ with His arms spread out on the cross. That's God's love for us. So that we know without a doubt, if God would do, allow that for His Son, that He loves you and nothing can separate you if you have that faith and you truly believe in Him. James 2, 14 and 17 say, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deed? So you should be that new creation in Christ. Can such faith save them? Head knowledge without heart changing knowledge, without a life being changed, or the way Jesus goes on to say it in John 3, and He said it before, verse 16. He said, you must be born again. Verse 17 of James says, In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by actions, is dead. Do you have that kind of faith? Is there the evidence in your life? Can someone tell it by the fruit that you have? If not, get things right with God. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The second thing here in these verses is that Jesus is the Messiah, or the Christ, as your version may say. Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed or chosen one. It's the equivalent word in Hebrew to Mashiach, or Messiah, the anointed. Traditional Jews believe that Jesus was not the anointed or chosen one. Because see, they wanted to believe in their mind, they didn't want to repent again, that this Messiah that Jesus claimed to be, even with all the miracles and everything that John said he recorded here, so that you might believe, they didn't want to accept that because that wasn't the Messiah and the Savior they're looking for. Even though everything was right in front of their face that said otherwise. So he came in as king on Monday... But on Friday, He was crucified and said, It is finished. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one by God that came to set men free of their sins. John 1, verses 9 through 13, we read, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. He came to that which was His own, but His did not receive Him. 
Yet to all who did receive Him, those who believed, in His name He gave the right or the power to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. It says here, Yet all to the who did receive Him. That means to take hold of, to lay securely, to make one your own possession. That's what believing means, to take hold of what God did for you through Jesus Christ. Take it as your own. That that's what you truly believe. So that when you do face times of persecution and stuff, you know that God is there with you. You know that He loves you. That Satan can't use that deception and lies on you. So the third thing I want to point out here is it says, life. That life, what does that mean to you? Does that mean He gave you the power to live a life now that glorifies Him? Or do you still think in your mind that this life is all about you and the things that you can accomplish and the things that please you? Or are you willing to die to yourself, take up your cross and follow after Jesus so that you can truly have life? How are you living is the question that Mike asked. And then the video said... How am I living? In John 10, the first 10 verses, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, you hypocrites, you who play the game, but don't really walk the walk. You have the talk. It looks good. But I'm saying that you're a hypocrite. You're an actor on the stage. Anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens a gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him, because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what He was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I tell you, listen up, hello. I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever ever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest or abundantly or rich and satisfying, depending on what your translation says. That's this life. That's here and now. That's the remainder of the life that you have left knowing that you belong to Christ. And see, you already can't use your whole life because you were born in sin. You had to reach that point where you decided and did repent and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, whether that took 15 years or 50 years. So you already let that much of your life, whatever it was, be gone when you only had so much. So even more reason for us to say, with the remainder of time that we have left, how can I live my life to bring glory and honor to God? Well, here's how you're a priest. Did you know that? I'm getting to the point here. You are a priest. A priest? Not me. You are all priests. 1 Peter 1.22 Now that you have purified yourselves, your souls, by obeying the truth, the Word of God, Jesus' commands, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Now that you have purified yourselves or your souls by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other. Huh. So if one of the criteria to know that I have purified myself is that I'll start loving others more, am I doing that? Do you have that passion for even your enemies? At least to forgive them. At least to tell them of the love of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're still struggling with some of those enemies, but the more that you turn to Christ, the more that you'll see that you were Barabbas that He set free in the first place. That you were the sinner, the thug, the murderer, the thief. That He came to set free. 
and He laid down His life quietly so that you could be saved. <clears throat> Love one another deeply from the heart. As passionately as you can as Christ loved and gave up His self for the church. But I can obey parts of the Bible, right? <laughs> no. If I believe this, I need to obey it. I don't need to struggle with that anymore. I just need to say, you're right, Father. Give me more strength. Give me more faith. Give me more of the love of Christ. And He will. Verse 23 says, the answer for why we obey. For we have been born again. That old life is gone. Sin has no power over you in death, and sin has no power over you in this life. Because you have the power of God living in you. John 3, verse 3 through 7 says, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Don't forget that. You are born again. And of all things, you've got a name tag that says, I'm a priest. Remember that. Verse 4 said, How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's room to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying this. You must be born again. So back to our scripture from 1 Peter, verse 23. For you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. Right here, through Jesus, what He did for us. The truth. The truth will set you free. I'll say it again. You're not a body with a spirit, but you're a spirit with a body. How are you going to use that body to bring glory and honor to God? Does it really matter? Verse 24 answers that. Yes, it does. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Seems like we heard that in a song. Seems like that was the theme of our men's walk, right, Dave? <laughs> huh. Everything that we know passes away, and kind of meaningless as Solomon's is uh, Solomon. Yes, <laughs> thinking of Song of Solomon. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes. I was having a failure to, for my brain to get to my mouth there. Sorry. He said it's all meaningless. And what he meant was chasing after all these things other than God's will. The man who had everything at his availability. And he had that because God gave it to him again because his heart was in the right place when he said, Father, tell me, Lord, tell me what I can do to govern and guide your people, to lead them in the ways of righteousness. But he got distracted. He got distracted by the things of this world. And when he realized that, he said, it's all meaningless. It's all nonsense. The only thing that matters is how my soul can use this body to live for God. The word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. This is what you've been taught. This is what Jesus taught. That's what the Word of God teaches. <clears throat> Peter was quoting Isaiah there, and I'll read that. Isaiah 40, verses 5 through 10 says, And the glory of the Lord was revealed. See, that happened at Calvary. And all the people will see together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? Do you say that? How can I live my life? Show me, Lord, so that I can bring you glory and honor. All the people are like grass, and their faithfulness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower falls because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the Word of God endures forever. You bring good news to Zion and to Boundary County. I'll put that in there so you get in perspective. Go on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem and Bonner's Ferry. Lift up your voice with a shout. Lift up and, and do not be afraid. 
Say to the towns of Judah or Idaho, See, his reward is with him, and his recompense or his reward accompanies him. Back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. It says, For all the people are like grass, and their glory is like the flower of the fields. But the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now get this, this is what Peter added to it. And this is the word that was preached to you and you and you and you and you. So do you believe that? Do you put your faith and trust in it? Chapter 2 then says, Therefore, that means what we just heard in 1 Peter 1, Therefore, since you've heard this gospel and you've trusted and you believe, you're born again, rid yourself of all malice. That's wickedness of every kind. And all deceit, all guile or fraud or fake intentions. All hypocrisy, counterfeit or play acting. <clears throat> all envy, covetousness wanting and desiring things that others have or the things of this world, and slander, evil speaking of any kind, even your thoughts. And then it goes on again to say, of every kind. It's already said at the beginning, all, all malice, all deceit. Every bit of it. Get rid of it. Because of what God did for you through Christ Jesus, if you believe that. In verse 2, do this instead. Like newborn babies crave spiritual milk. You don't have to tell a newborn baby to, to drink milk. They cling to it. They crave it. They hunger and thirst for it the way we're supposed to hunger and thirst for righteousness, for the living water, for the bread of life that Jesus offers us. And it's what they have to have to get the nourishment to grow. It's no, no coincidence here he's using that as an example. You must do this so that by it you may grow up Grow to maturity, grow to be like Christ in your salvation. Verse 3, now that you have tasted, what have you tasted? That the Lord is good, that He's kind, merciful, loving, gracious. And after I come to Him, what do I need to do next? It says, as you come to Him, to who? The living stone, the one rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to Him. God's Son was precious, is precious to Him, but yet He let Him lay down His life for you because He loved you that much. Would you lay down the life of your child for someone else? That's love. And God did it when you were still His enemy. You had to do nothing to clean up your act first. You do it, therefore, because of what He did do for you by the power of His Spirit, by letting Jesus live through you. Verse 5 says, you also, you also are what? Like Jesus, the living stone. And you are being built into a spiritual house or temple. That's where God resides, right? He resides with you, in you now. And when we come together collectively as a body, He's here. This is the church of Jesus. We are built into a spiritual house to be what? A holy priesthood. Now you've got to know a little bit here about what the priest did. They offered sacrifices. They were picked out and anointed by God to represent Him to the, to the people. And they gave sacrifices. Now, if Peter is meant, meant, meaning us to realize what he's talking about, and he's talking to those that are being persecuted at the time, the Jews that were spread about, and Christians that were spread about, that were persecuted, then he's saying to them, you are the priests. You are the ones that are going to be sacrificing. The reason that you are sacrificing is so that others can see the truth and come to that knowledge. You are priests. And what do a holy priest do? He goes on to say it. To be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Holy. Holy means set apart, sanctified, a saint. We are holy priests. Set apart by God. Priests, officials, delegates of God to represent Him and to offer up sacrifices on the behalf of others. Because see, Jesus already offered up the sacrifice for our sins. We're supposed to go sacrifice to help others find a way. Are you doing that? 
Hebrews 8 verse 3 says, Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And you're a priest. 1 Peter 2 5 says, You also, and you can put your name in there, like living stones are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Now why do you think Peter used holy there? Why didn't he say a joyful priesthood or something like that? He said holy. Because see, you are holy. You don't have to become holy. You were made holy when you were born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you truly believed. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 15, if we go back a little further, tells us that. It says, Therefore, with the minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not confirm to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. So you don't have to go about trying to be holy. You are holy. If you realize that, then you can live as the priest that God has called you and set you apart to be, to represent Him to others by offering gifts and spiritual sacrifices to those who don't know the way, the truth, and the life. Roughly 700 years before Christ, Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 6.3, And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of His glory. We get to be called holy, just as God is holy, holy, holy. And John wrote this at the end of the Bible in Revelation, verse 4, chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was, covering, was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay down their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for You created all things, and by Your will they were created and have their being. And God created each and every one of you and redeemed you back by the blood of His precious Son to be His priest. Revelation 1 verse 4 through 6 say, Grace and peace to you from Him who is and who was and who is to come. For, from the seven spirits before His throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kingdoms of the earth, to Him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood, and made us to be a kingdom and priests, to serve His God and Father. To Him be glory and power forever and ever. So I expound upon Mike's question and say, will you live as the priest that you were called to be? Father, we do thank You so much for all that You do. We thank You that You do love us, that You love us beyond anything that we can fathom. And that You would lay down Your Son's life to save us. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. May our lives be a pleasing fragrance to You as we lay down our lives in sacrifice and service to show others the way. Because You loved us so much. Father, help us to know more of Christ and His love through the power of Your Spirit that resides inside of us. Help us to be the temples that You have called us to be. And help us to proclaim Your Word boldly and to live a life that brings glory and honor to You. Thank You for this church and the service that they do bring. I just pray that You bless each and every one as they obediently serve You. And I thank You for their service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.